Psalms 112. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feared the Lord. So blessings come upon them that fear God. Not circumstances. The fear that, you know, it's not that God is going to, you know, send a, a lightning upon me. Or God's going to, you know, send a tornado and kill, you know, destroy my house. It's not like that. It's the fear of the Lord that the fellowship you can have with him. The fear that God will leave you when you continue in sin. That's the fear. And that your sin may go so far as cause death. Listen, a man that takes the Lord's Supper unconsciously, unknowing, there are there are resources that happens to him. Sickness, death, weak. Somebody who's like that doesn't fear the Lord. It's just, it's just another cookie and just another drink. They don't realize what God has done for them, what God is doing for them. Fearing the Lord is not the terror that God is going to do things to us. It's the fear that God will just let us go. You'll be without his company. And then, yeah, fearing the God that can do things to you in your life, can do things in your life to, to bring you into his company again. Jail, cancer, can be things that God will do to bring you or get your attention. And then you need to fear. Stay with the Lord and blessed be the Lord and you'll receive a blessing by him. That delighteth greatly in his commandments. Now we're going to get into a few verses here. We're going to see that this passage, though we can apply praise the Lord, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. And that delighteth greatly in his commandments, that's not us. We are told to follow the commandments of the Lord, but that is not our source of our salvation. Our source of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Following the commandments keeps us right with God. Listen, if you murder and you're a born-again Christian, don't expect God to bless you. If you're in jail because you stole something, and in jail you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, okay, you still got to finish your sentence. But when we're talking about commandments in the Old Testament, that is the salvation. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. If you keep to the commandments, you're going to have a lot of children. You want to know something? Since I've been saved in, since 1987, April 21st, do you know I know I know a lot of Christian women who want children? And for whatever reason, God has made them unable. You know, I know a lot of Christian families that have adopted. Are you telling me because they have to adopt or they remain childish that God's not going to bless them and they're not delighted greatly in the Lord? Now, you see the trouble you get when you don't rightly divide, when you don't go into dispensations? Walk up to a, a born-again Christian woman who is married to a man and wants to have children and doesn't have children and read these two verses to her and what's she going to think? Well, she's not right in the eyes of God because she doesn't have any children. Wrong. Psalms is written to Jewish people. The law proclaims if you do right, then the promise of children. How do you like that? How about if you take, all right, you want to take this verse to the church aid. That delighteth greatly in his commandments, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. All right, the commandment of the Lord is go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. And those that get saved, they become your spiritual children. Now that's where you can apply being delighted greatly in the Lord by doing his commandments. But that's spiritualizing. Darkly, Psalms 112 is to the Jew under the law. 
the generation of the upright shall be blessed. Well, that's a practical truth. Those who are upright in God will be happy. That is the fruit of the Spirit. If you're not upright, if you're living unrighteous, you're not going to be happy. Even if you are a born-again Christian, even if you are a Jew under the Old Testament. Do you think the time when Bathsheba came to David and said, Hey, I'm pregnant. You think during that whole time until he repented that he was happy and joyful? He wasn't upright. He was an adulterer and then became a murderer. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. All right, how do you know that this is Old Testament and not New Testament? Wealth and riches shall be in his house. I want to claim that verse 2014. I'll tell you right now, you'd be foolish. I'll give you one name. Actually, I'll give you two names. One I'll give you is Paul. You know, it says at the end of Romans that Paul had his own hired house. He didn't even have a house. He rented a house. How much riches and wealth did Paul have as a human being? So what you going to tell me? That Paul wasn't right? Paul wasn't upright? Paul didn't delight greatly in the, with the commandments? Paul didn't praise the Lord? Are you going to tell me that Paul's a complete failure by his life? And there are people who will say yes. But Paul is in a dis different dispensation. He's saved, Acts chapter 9. He's saved by Jesus Christ, which you couldn't get under the law. How about this one? The Bible says, though he was rich, yet he became poor. What wealth and riches shall be in his house when you name the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, are you going to tell me that Jesus Christ, according to Psalms 112, verses 1, 2, and 3, was was rejected, was not upright, didn't fear God, because he didn't have riches, he didn't have wealth, he didn't even have a house. Paul had a hired house. Jesus slept out in the mountain. So it can't be New Testament. That philosophy that if you're right with God and your life is blessed, you're going to have money, you're going to have children, you're going to have land, is an Old Testament thing. And yet Job, who was right in the eyes of God, and even Satan proclaimed that Job followed God, Job chapter 2. Isn't that wonderful that Satan proclaimed about Job, Job's righteousness? Job lost it all in chapter 1. What are you going to say? Job was a failure? You know, on the base on the testimony of Satan and Lord, if Job died, he was going, I don't know where he was, I don't know, in Abraham's bosom or paradise, wherever. I don't think Job was going to hell. But based upon Job losing everything, his three friends, you read into Psalms 112. It's great how we read that tonight and we're reading this now. You know what they're thinking Job was? He was a failure in the eyes of God. Job, you lost everything. You must be wrong with God. And when you read that account of that philosophy, that is why those three men spoke against Job. And that's why Job 42, God says, you guys need to repent. You may have lost everything because in the eyes of the Lord, you are doing right. In the eyes of Satan, you are doing right. And Satan wants to put you on the battlefield. He wants to try you, and he wants you to fail. By the way, Job got it back all in the end. Doubled. So when somebody comes to you and looks at you and says, your life is not what it should be. Give me $10. I'll give you $10 million, and you'll be blessed and all that. They are in Old Testament. Because the New Testament say, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. In America, you are on borrowed money. You may live in a house, but it ain't your house. 
You wait for the Chinese one of these days to walk up to the, to the, to the steps of the White House and whoever the president is and say, we want our money now. Well, we ain't got it. Well, you pay the money or America becomes Chinese. Then what are you going to say with all the Christians that loses their churches and loses their property and loses everything they have? What are you going to say? They all became failures? No, America has always been a failure with the economy in the last few presidents. If the government came right now and forced me out of this house, took my car because I'm a born-again Christian, took away my Bible, arrested me for going on the street for passing out gospel tracts and preaching, I end up, end up in a Daytona uh, prison. And I go to one of the big prisons in Florida. Are you trying to tell me I'm a failure? That's exactly what happened to Paul. Be careful. I've known churches in this area who are not rightly divine. They are not dispensationalists. All right. And his righteousness endureth forever. See, it's not our righteousness, is it? Can you say, <laughs> I'm not changing the Bible, but can you say, and your righteousness endure forever? Well, let's put that in the first person. Can it say, and stylish righteousness endure forever? Never. Because I'm not righteous. The only way I am righteous is by Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ took my sins and put it upon him, and I took the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus Christ, and it was applied to me. I'm a sinner. I'm going to be a sinner to this body is buried in a grave or the rapture happens. I have no righteousness of my own. I work not because not to be saved or not to stay saved. I work because I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God sees my righteousness, he turns to the right hand and sees his son. You know how you were righteous in the Old Testament? You did everything you were supposed to do. And you still failed. But you did what God told you to do. And you still waited for the Messiah to come. And to finish the work. Unto the upright, there arises light in the darkness. Wow. When you read John, John chapter 3, it says that man today is in the darkness. He's wicked. And when he comes to the light, he's searching. He, he doesn't want to be in darkness no more. Unto the upright, that's someone who's doing right, there arises light in the darkness. You know the Old Testament saint did not know where he was going? You know the Old Testament saint had nothing new about the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son? We have that light. You know the Old Testament saint couldn't have eternal security? He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. That's God. Unto the upright, Lord Jesus Christ, there arises light in darkness when he came upon this miserable planet. For the Bible says in John 1, he is light, capital L. He is gracious. Full of compassion, for God so loved the world. Christ loveth his. We call him friend. We call him Savior. We call the Father by Jesus Christ and righteous. A good man, there is none good. There is none that doeth right. But in general, a good man showeth favor. 
So what do you do when you got an employer who's got employees who can't make a living and he they won't help him out? They're not good men. What do you do when somebody who goes to church and won't help you? Not a good man. That's a Bible standard. And lendeth. Uh-oh, gives out money. And according to the law of the Jewish law, they're to lend money to their, to their neighbors and not ask for usury, interest. You want to go take that verse and apply it to American Bank? which is not applied to America and it's not applied to the New Testament. Yeah, but there are Christians out there who will give money and who will lend money to, to brethren in the church because they're cheerful givers, because they love the Lord and they love the brethren to help them out. So there's a verse that you can use today, but you don't have to. But it is the love of a Christian that has God in their life that, hey, I'm going to help you out or I'll lend you the money. And then there, there are the wicked ones who never pay it back, which I've heard many, many stories. Especially by pastors who have helped people out and never saw a red cent back. I've been around. I've heard the stories. He will guide his affairs with discretion. All right, there's the main rule of verse 5. Every homeless person on the street that comes up to me, I'm supposed to give them a cheeseburger or $5. Every single one of them. No, the Bible says with discretion. How about that? If I think somebody is not going to use the money properly, discretion will tell me, don't give it. I'm not out there to give everybody money. I'm not out there to give everybody something. I'm not going to lend money to somebody in the church who 45 other Christians are indebted. Uh, he's indebted to 45 other Christians. Listen, if that guy's indebted to one other Christian, my discretion says, well, you go pay him back first. A guy comes up to me, oh, I want money. All right, I'll take you over to Burger King. Uh, but, no, just please give me the cash. No, no, discretion says, okay, what are you going to do with the cash? I've done that several times in my life. I've only had two people ever take me up on the food. And I know for sure that one guy, man, he was pleased. That's discretion. So you can apply verse 5 to our lives today, but use discretion. Use your head. Pray about it. Surely he shall not be moved forever. Well, wait a minute. Was it Moses right in God? Was it Moses upright? And he died before his time. And never got to go in the promised land with the Israelites. So you tell me that Moses did not use discretion. He wasn't a good man. He wasn't upright. He didn't have no righteousness. He wasn't mighty. He wasn't blessed. He didn't fear the Lord. I don't believe it. Throw that verse out and put it, put it in the garbage. Get your Bible eraser. You know when forever ends for earth time? When the heavens and earth are rolled up and flee from God. That's forever. Eternal is when you go beyond that period where there's no more time. So Moses, surely he shall not be moved forever. Is Moses going to be back in the promised land? Yes, he's going to show up with Elijah. In the tribulation. But that's not it. He's going to be there during the millennium. The Jews will be in the land with the Lord Jesus Christ reigning. It hasn't happened yet. Hebrews chapter 11 says they look for the promise. The problem hasn't come yet. It will for those Jews. 
And believe me, when they get in that land by the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be no Middle Eastern people out to kill them. They will be the world's most looked upon people, and there will be Gentiles that will come to see Jesus. They'll stop with a Jew and say, hey, take us to the King of Kings because you're his people. And that Jew will lead them like they were supposed to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So some verses jump over many, 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 many years and will happen. That verse is for the Jews in the millennium. The righteous shall be in an everlasting remembrance. How is that happening? Jesus said, my word shall never, never you're going to have the Word of God, the Bible in heaven. Forever. For eternal words of God. And you'll be able to look over there and say, Oh, there's David. There's Samuel. There's the Lord Jesus. There's Paul. There's Solomon. Forever recorded. Now there are some that say that this is the book of life. That everyone who is saved, their name is somewhere in this book. And if it's true, somewhere in these pages, there's going to be the name Stiley Hayward. My name will be forever in remembrance. Everlasting remembrance. And it may not even be Stiley Hayward. What would be, one of my new name that God's going to give me is, is in here? That I don't know yet. That would be an everlasting remembrance. Isn't is it going to be weird that we're going to have the Bible in heaven? Jesus says every time, every title, every, I, I can't quote it. Every word of God is pure. Jesus said it's going to be in eternal. It's going to be in heaven. And we're going to be without sin. Can you imagine reading about the adulterous and murderous Events of David's life with Bathsheba and not even know what that is anymore. Now, unlike the Bible perverts, they're not gonna God is not gonna cut that out of the Bible. That's in there to stay. Only Bible perverts will cut it out and add to it. Wouldn't it be everlasting funny that if when they cut their Bible, they cut their own names out? And God looks to the, their Bible, maybe their book of life, and say, I don't, I don't see the name. I see a big hole. I see a hole where your name was supposed to be. Oh, isn't that interesting? Why is there a hole in your Bible? That was where your name was. I guess you can't. What does it say in Revelation 22? If you add or subtract, your name shall be removed. Better be careful. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. That's bad news. Like Job. Isn't it great how we read Job tonight? Here we are doing Psalms 112. Was Job afraid when those guys came to him saying, we lost the, the camels, we lost the cattle, we, your children are dead? Did Job fear? Why do you fear? And we have a more sure word of prophecy given to us that Job didn't even have Genesis. And we've got 66 books, and when we hear troubles, we get panicky. Even David got afraid. Solomon's up, I mean not Solomon, Absalom's up the authority of the kingdom. David's like, let's everyone pack up and go. And David was a man after God's heart. Abraham, we're going to go into Egypt, dear. Uh, you're my sister.
He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. News. It doesn't even say if it's, it's in happening. Just tidings. News. There are Christians out there that are afraid of what's in tomorrow's newspaper that hasn't even been printed yet. There are Christians more worried about the stock report for tomorrow's newspaper than they are that the Lord Jesus Christ may come back and they'll be found wanting. There are preachers out there who are more worried about getting their paycheck than worrying about in their congregation who's saved and serving and who's not saved. Or even worrying about the garbage they're teaching to their, their congregation. His heart is fixed. Now that doesn't mean the heart was broken and you've got to go into the hospital and have them open you up and, and put new valves in there. That's not what that's talking about. That's fixing your heart in 2014. This heart is it's set on God and what is Romans... Uh, 9 and 10 said, With the heart man believes unto righteousness. Is your heart fixed on the righteousness of God, the Lord Jesus Christ? Trusting in the Lord. Even if evil tidings did come, is your heart fixed on the Lord? And the Lord will take care of it, whatever it is. It happened, to, it happened. An illness in a family, a death in a family. Well, it happened. But they were unsaved. It happened. Death happens. Oh, I can't serve the Lord anymore. Why not? Why not? Your heart's not fixed. I got these troubles in my life and I can't serve the Lord. Why not? You don't have a fixed heart. You're not trusting in the Lord. A man that has a fixed heart and is trusting the Lord, despite the evil tidings, that when events actually do come, they're going to continue to serve the Lord and do right. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid. Now there is a fear. That instant fear that you get, that's normal in your life. When you break out with sweating, when you break out with the, with the cold sweats and something that is happening in your life, you know, you're about almost to run into another car. You're going to get nervous. You're going to get very, very unsettled. You're going to have fear. That is normal. But when you continue in that fear, that's abnormal. A good healthy fear is when you step out on the street and you see a bus coming. Oh, well, I gotta back up. Okay, that's a healthy fear. But don't fear crossing the street or buses for the rest of your life. You know, when you get a report from from the water company and it says that there's arsenic in your water, don't oh I'm not ever gonna drink it no more. Well there, there's a, a healthy amount of arsenic. If, that, if I can say that. But don't ever not drink the water anymore because it's got arsenic. It's dwelling on that fear. It's making you unworthy of service for God that you won't do something. I can't give a gospel track to that person because one guy yelled at me. No. Until he see his desire upon his enemy. Now we've read that over and over in David's life. We read that over and over in the book of Psalm. Lord, go get my enemies. Lord, destroy my enemies. And the Bible says for us, we're to love our enemies. He said, well, how can David say that? Because these were people who were enemy of the Jews and enemy of the God. But we are told even still, even they are an enemy of God, we're to love them, witness to them, and we're not to have any dealing with them in their life. And when you tell them about Jesus Christ and they keep on going, God will do what God will do. Don't let your enemies turn your heart from serving God. He has dispersed. 
Give it out. You know, when you go up to a soda machine, it dispenses soda. He has given to the poor. Use that discretion we talked about. His righteousness endures forever. Again, giving to the poor is not your righteousness. When you give to the poor, we, among the brethren, I would say something like, Hey, I'm giving you to giving you this in the name of Jesus Christ because we're brethren. Oh, I want to thank you, brother. No, no, no. Thank the Lord that he's given me to help you. Somebody in the street, you, you, okay, I'm going to give you five bucks. Uh, whatever, I'm going to give you five bucks. I'm going to give you this five bucks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll even say, which I've done, I'll give you this five bucks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you use it wrong, may, may God turn it on you. You do it because you love the Lord. You don't do it because the law says to. The law said to the Jew they were to help the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Christ's righteousness endures forever for us. His horn, that's a symbol of power, shall be exalted with honor. When you've got two rams fighting it out, the honor comes to the to the land to the ram that is alive, or to the ram that still has the horn intact when the other one has ran away because his horn has been broken, or maybe mortally or completely wounded by the horns of the other, and then with the exalted ram that gets the, his horn there with honor. Usually it's fighting over a mate. He gets the mate and he gets to prolong with more rams. And let That's the honor. Victory. Power. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. See what? The prosperity of the man that's doing right. Doing right by what God said to do. Why is it today when we do what God wants us to, the ones that say they are Christians are the ones that are grieved. The ones that are trying to stop us from doing what God has told us to do. Because they see you doing what the Bible says and they're too scared or too wimpy or too more in the world to do what God wants them to do and they're agreed by you doing right. You're sticking the word, the sword into their life and it hurts. And you notice those people I've ever dealt with, they could never throw a Bible verse, any Bible verse to try to prevent you from doing what you're doing. Well, you know, you turn people away. Well, that kind of language is, you know, it's bad. Show me a Bible verse. Show me a Bible verse of me preaching about hell is wrong. He shall gnash with his teeth. A grinding. A biting. That's what they did to Stephen. They gnashed upon him with his teeth. They really chewed the preacher out. And melted away like a snail, like a candle. The only thing left is a big blob. The desire of the wicked shall perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not, what? Perish. And it's funny the Lord came to me the other night when I was speaking about perishing and preaching. When you come to a bottle of milk in your refrigerator and it has perished, 
It has passed its usefulness. It has passed the age. You dump it out. You throw it away. It does not get used any longer. And that is what man that is what God will do to a wicked man that will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior. He'll just dump him out into the lake of fire. We are to put our trust in the Lord. We are not to put our trust in the Lord because he'll make us rich. Or he'll promise us to get all kinds of seeds. Even though for a Christian he does say we're going to get fruit. We are to help others. But we are to do it discreetly. With discretion. Even if it's a Christian brother or sister. Now, I have had times, too, where I've helped a fellow Christian. I've had a pastor come up to me and say, Brother, I appreciate what you did, but don't do that to that family anymore. You're wasting They will not do. I know. I, I believe what you did, but I just let you know. And that's discretion by a pastor to help another person. Listen, you know something about somebody. You go help them out. I have been in churches where we get a people, oh, if you come to the service Sunday or Wednesday night or whatever, you know, if you come, we'll give you money. That's not discretion. Because they don't come back. I know people, personally, i got two names in mind. They were going to all these different, uh, if you go to these, uh, we call it sales pitch meetings. And if you bring a coupon, you can get a free item. They'll go to those meetings just to get the free item. And they won't listen to the thing. They'll just, they're just there just to get the free item. That's not discretion. That's a waste of money. And you're going to have your heart fixed and established on God when even if it's frightening news or a frightening event, you are still to stay with God and trust in the Lord. For the wicked people are watching you. And it will be a testimony to what God has done in your life. If they know you're a Christian. They got to know you're a Christian. You just don't think because your big lighter shines. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee.